Hello everyone, uh, I'm David Webb from ACAS. Uh, ACAS is a, an independent organization offering advice to employers and employees about matters in the workplace. Um, we have a website where you can get advice, uh, www.acas.org.uk. Uh, we have special advisors that can come into your workplace and help you with specific problems you may have. And we uh, also um, have training courses uh, that we can offer both employers and employees. Today we're here to talk about one particular topic, uh, which is about um, religion or belief discrimination in the workplace and how to prevent it. Now, I must stress that we can't take questions about individual cases or specific religions. Uh, this is about talking about the subject generally. Um, mm -hmm. Now I will ask the other members of the panel to introduce themselves. Good afternoon everyone, I'm Julie Dennis and I'm the Head of Diversity and Inclusion here at ACAS. Hi, I'm Steve Porch, I work for the Government Equalities Office with the Government Department that's responsible for the Equality Act 2010, which is the UK's primary anti-discrimination legislation and I'm on my particular responsibilities I lead on the religion or belief provisions. Um, ACAS has just launched new guidance on religion or belief discrimination, which again you can find uh, on the ACAS website. Um, um, and today we're going to talk about some of the main issues uh, revolving around uh, religion or belief discrimination in the workplace. And uh, we'll start off uh, with a topic um, about what do we think are the, are the main uh, problem areas where religion or belief discrimination in the workplace can arise? Okay, well I think one of the main areas that, that seems to be quite common with people asking me about are what are my rights for having time off work for my religious beliefs? And another common question is, and, and how can I manifest my religion or my belief actually at work, either through my behaviour or through my outward signs of things that I wear, jewellery or headscarves and stuff? So I think from my experience, those are the two two areas that primarily seem to be the most common, common things that people ask about. Yeah, I'd agree with that, actually. Um, as a HR professional as well, managers always have to juggle uh, different requirements from staff and when you've got staff asking for time off for religious festivals or staff uh, presenting themselves wearing clothes that may not be within the work stress code then that's for employees will need to look at how does that fit in with that organisation. Well shall we stick with that particular topic about yeah. dress code yeah. uh, to start off with? Um, what do you feel that an employer should do? Because uh, this is one of the questions we're sort of getting in about um, managing uh, a dress code at work to do with religion or belief. If they get somebody who comes to them and says, um, I'd like to wear a headscarf, um, how would you sort of do <coughs> that? I think if I, the one piece of advice I give to any employer is the question you should ask yourself is, why shouldn't I agree to the request? And if you've got a valid reason, the chances are you've got a very valid reason. If you kind of sit there and think, why shouldn't I require um, Because it's the rules. Well, that's not a very good reason. Well, it's no reason at all, is it? So I think if you actually ask yourself that question, is the request legitimate? Does it make sense? Is it something that's sensible? Or is this person trying one on? Mm -hmm. And is it a kind of is it proportionate for me to let them do, wear what it is that they want to? Now, there may be lots of valid reasons why you decide that um, I, I don't think it's appropriate for you to either wear that at work for a number of reasons. For instance, the most obvious one would be health and yeah. safety reasons. Mm -hmm. So something like a, a, a free flowing headscarf or a chain which had a religious icon obviously on it. Wearing it in an environment with machinery orientated fashion, yeah, or it could get called exactly. Or, yeah. yeah, that's a very good reason for actually saying why you can't um, actually have that wouldn't be appropriate for using in the, in the workplace. But generally, I think the advice should be to employers why can't you agree to that, that request? Yeah, I'd agree with that actually. I think health and safety would be your only reason, really, for saying no, uh, and it is that. You know, if, if someone is wearing a religious symbol that's on the chain, then maybe they could wear an alternative, so wear it in the form of a brooch, so therefore it wouldn't get caught in, in machinery. 
or there could be you know hygiene reasons why you have to wear protective clothing again seeing that well actually could that individual be able to wear their religious symbols underneath that uh, protective clothing so they're still being able to practice their religion but also that they're complying with the health and safety regulations within the organization but i would say that would be the only really objective justification for saying no to a yeah i mean <coughs> some there have been some cases where it's a question of the employer thinking well Will my customers like this? I don't care very much. That's not a legitimate reason for saying you can't wear this, you cannot wear that item, you can't express yourself in this or that way. But I think the other thing to remember is that it's not a one size fits all if you kind of pardon no, me. Right, in the sense that if you to go back to talking about wearing a religious item on a chain, it depends what it is you're actually doing. Um, and two of the more famous cases that we've had in the UK over the past five years have been ostensibly on the face of them very, very similar because they're both about an employee who was wearing either a cross or a crucifix with a chain around their neck. And when they went through to the European courts, the European court found in favour of one of the, the applicants and not on the other. And the primary reason was that one of the applicants was a, a practising nurse working on a ward in a clinical environment and was wearing a chain on a, a crucifix on a chain. But of course, that could a uh, uh, patient could accidentally yeah. get a hold of it, grab it, hurt themselves, hurt yeah. her, whereas the other person was a reception worker for British Airways, and wearing her cross outside her uniform is an entirely different set of individual circumstances. circumstances. Exactly, yes. Yes. You know, you've got to think about the specifics of it. I think the only, um, you know, an, an employer might say, well, um, how should I approach this in the first place? And I, what I'd suggest is that an employer should think about why do I need a dress code? What are those reasons? Is it to present a corporate image? Uh, is it for sort of health and safety purposes? Um, so they need to think about that. But what they need to think about with the dress code beyond that is consult with your staff yeah. and um, maybe employee networks or trade unions if they're in the workplace as well. So they talk to them about the dress code. This is what we'd like to do. You get their buy-in an understanding as why we want this dress code and if people are sort of understand why they need to dress a certain way then they're sort of less likely to object to it but still the employer will need to be mindful that some employees may need not to want to dress in a certain particular way like close fitting clothes or whatever it might want what happen to be because of reasons of religion or belief and if somebody comes to an employer about that, they sh that shouldn't come as too much as a surprise. And I think if they can, as you said, Steve, um, accommodate that request, then they should do so because, again, as you said, they've got to have a very good business reason for not doing it. And it's got to be a good business reason. It's not just something like you said earlier, but they suddenly th they think hard about it and they try to think of a reason. It's yeah. got to be something that comes very naturally and readily to the business. And I think, you know, we, we see some really good examples of where organisations have been able to adapt their dress uh, code, you know, where you may have um, a place where people have to wear a uniform. So, you know, recognising that there may be some uh, women in the workplace who will want to wear loose fitted clothes or be able to cover their legs. So yes. adapting that or being able to wear scarves or hijabs or whatever, having it in that company colour, you know, I, I remember when, you know, steering off a bit from religion, but when I was pregnant, you know, I had to wear a uniform and I was able to wear a pregnancy, you know, something that was a bit uh, more accommodating. As long as it was in those corporate colours, I was still, you know, able to have that mm. uniform. So it is about employers just thinking about how to adapt things. And I think you're quite right, David, having that conversation involving your staff. If you've got a staff network for religion and belief, excellent resource go and talk to that staff network and say what are the options we've got here how can we work this but actually the simple thing could be just asking the member of staff themselves oh, what yes. works best for you this is the <coughs> color code this is what we'd like you to wear how can we adapt this so that it meets your religious uh, needs as well very much so yeah and i think it's important to 
member that as an employer, that interaction with the member of staff and the, the staff representative organisations isn't a one-off. That isn't what you do when you design your dress code. That's an iterative and an interactive process. So things will change. Your, your staffing makeup will change. Their needs may change. You need to be responsive to it. So just because you had a legitimate reason for saying no six months ago, it doesn't mean that that's a legitimate reason today. No. Or in six months time, things change. Um, shall we now sort of move on to the second yeah. aspect of uh, that question that came in about um, dealing and managing uh, requests for time off for reasons of uh, religion or belief and that could be to um, for a religious holiday, it could be to go to a religious festival, it might be for a period of religious observance um, and I think it's often the way that these requests sometimes are handled that can cause the problems. I don't know how you want to chip well, in. Well, I'll, I'll hand over to the HR expert. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I was just going to say, I think if there's any HR professionals or managers that are watching this Facebook Live today, that's probably one of the biggest issues as a manager you have to deal with. Members of staff requesting time off for leave. Uh, of course, uh, the regulations do not give people an entitlement to have additional time off uh, to practice or for a religious festival, for example. But a good employer should look at enabling that employee to use their annual leave as and when they need to, as long as it fits in with the needs of the business. So you could have a scenario where you may have a number of staff wanted to take time off and it's not about that manager going oh well you know this particular situation out trumps that one it's more about looking at what other business needs can we accommodate more than one person being off at the same time can we uh, shuffle people around the business to cover and again having that conversation with the individual wouldn't you say Steve that yeah. um, you know sitting down with the individual you know is this as a particular reason why you need to have this day off and having that conversation? And even when you, you know, we mentioned there about having the day off, it may well be that somebody needs to, or wants to have the time off to attend a specific religious rite. So it may well be a particular ceremony. So that although they're asking for the day off, it may well be that they could have the afternoon, the morning, or even just a specific couple of hours. As an employer, you're not going to know unless you ask. Yes. No. No. And sometimes, I think that's a really valid point actually, because sometimes people may think, I have to take yeah. the whole day off, yeah. but it could be, well actually, I can go there in the morning and then come in and do the rest of the day, or leave early. Ironically, some of the employees may think they're doing the employer a favour by asking for the whole day off, rather than, can I have a couple of hours to go off to a religious yeah. ceremony? And they think they're doing the right thing, or in actual fact, that dialogue between the two can actually find a much better solution for both of them. Yeah. And again, again, in terms of what the employer could do from a practical point of view, and see how you feel about this is that they should really make it clear to all the employees that no matter what the reason for leave that they understand uh, how they should ask about it for make those requests hope how those requests will be handled that they'll all be looked at individually on and on merit and really there can be, as you've already touched on, Julie, there can be, and uh, I think all managers have experienced this at one time or another, where you get too many people asking for leave at the same time. And then there is, um, I think, a situation, as long as it's made clear to stuff, where you could have a first come, first serve basis. But then, again, you've got to be careful because you might have somebody come late with a very urgent request yeah. as well yeah. you know that just might come out of the blue but it's essential they have that time off mm -hmm. so it's it's about really looking at the individual circumstances of each case and then responding to that request on merit absolutely there is no one trump card that any bit employee yeah. can pull out their pocket and go aha i play my card in there or i'm entitled to this day off work so you know you, if you Look at different scenarios. Somebody asks for a day off for religious purposes. Uh, a father says it's my son's first birthday and I really want to spend the day with my family. Or somebody who says my aunt is seriously ill and they live far away and I really want to go visit. Three very, very legitimate requests for having time off. And as an employer, 
how the hell do you actually evaluate those? It's very difficult. But you can't just automatically say one trumps the other in any case. You've got to look at the very specifics of the individual request. And I think the key rule is, is if you say, you know, without having that discussion, without giving a reasonable explanation, and quite outrightly say no, yeah. you could leave yourself at risk of potentially discriminating against that individual on the grounds of religion. So, you know, it's worth doing that extra bit of time and work with that employee to explain, find more information and then be able to make that decision. Yeah. Yeah. No is one of the most unhelpful answers yeah. ever, in the sense of, no, you can't have it. Well, all you're going to have is a very disgruntled and unhappy employee. But the chances are, if you actually sit down and say, I'm really sorry, I can't because, and you give them your explanation, you're thinking, mm -hmm. they're going to think, I've been treated fairly, and that's what it really is about being treated fairly. I think the other thing, as well, in terms of time off for religious festivals, we normally know yeah. when they're going to be coming up. So, again, it's about that line manager relationship with the individual as part of those regular conversations that individual may be bringing that up a couple of months, you know, before, which you'd say, Would it be possible? I'd like to, I'm looking at booking my leave, just like we have the same conversation. I'm going to be going away for two weeks. Yeah. Is it convenient for me to book that time off? As a manager, you'd much sooner have that forward notice because then you can look at your resource rather than a person coming forward the day before yeah. saying, can I have tomorrow off because it's a particular day in relation to my religion. Yeah, so mean, if, for those employees listening, you know when those celebrations are coming up. So think in advance, have those, start having those conversations with your employer to see if they've built at that time. Yeah, my brother in Australia is going to get married in six months' time. I want to go there for two weeks. I'm letting you know now. Well, give your employer as yeah. much notice yeah. as possible, and they've got more chance than they've been able to accommodate and work around for you as well. And again, I think what the employer needs to understand is that if they are going to say no, then it's got to be for a good business yeah. reason. And they can, they can say no, yeah. and if that business reason is justifiable. Yeah, I mean, that, that's an important one. I mean, there is a case law which has actually said, if a, an employer has a, a legal responsibility to do something, such as have a, a, a building site staff with a certain number of security guards, or have a certain number of staff working at a particular venue at a specific time, for, for childcare purposes or for safety purposes, and somebody says, I need to I want to have some time off because of my religion and the employer goes, I'm sorry, but we've only got five people and we are legally yeah. required under a contract to have five people on the site at the time. It's, it's clearly understandable for the employer to have to say, no, I can what sympathy they may have, no, I'm really sorry, but under the specific circumstances, we can't accommodate that request. Mm -hmm. But sometimes some employers may, for that, if they've got three people, they may say, actually, is this something that you three can yeah. sort out and come to some arrangement? Yeah. Because what may be urgent for someone, they may then say, actually, well, okay, it, it'd be okay if I take the following day off, you have that date and yeah. have the following day. So, again, sometimes you can do a bit of compromise as well, can't you? Yeah, it's got to be given to you. Know, I think the one off or the two off scenario is more, more realistic and more easy to yeah. accommodate than somebody who says, right, every week I do not want to work this day or I do not want to work at that time. Because that puts extra hours and extra pressure on other people who may have different reasons for wanting just to spend family time or something, then incrementally it becomes more difficult. But again, it's, it's about that interaction, discussion between the employer and the employee and the employees themselves. And on that subject of discussion, um, something else that I think an employer would need to understand is that they might have, say, 10 people in a workplace who all happen to be of the same faith. Yeah. Uh, it might be that three of those of that particular faith uh, do not make any request to take time off for a religious holiday. Um, three others ask for all of that religious holiday. Now, again, this is where they have to think about dealing with each case yeah. on the basis of individual merit, thinking, well, the other three didn't ask for time off. I'm not going to give you time off because they didn't need it, so why should you? So it's a matter of, again, talking to the employer so they understand that particular em em employee's uh, depth of their faith, why is it so important to them, and why they need the time off, even though the three who didn't ask 
didn't request it. So it's a question of understanding that in the in individuality yeah. and judging it all on that basis. Well, I would say, David, in that situation, again, as a, as a manager, this is about take away the religious bit. This is about how are you allocating leave? How are your staff taking their leave? And um, it's not about, well, you've not asked for it, but see, has. It's about can I accommodate this leave request? Has the individual got enough annual leave allowance to take the leave in the first place? Mm -hmm. If the answer to that is yes, right, can I accommodate for this person to be away from work for this period of time? Yes or no? You know, they're, for me, they're the first simple answers to those questions, and then you then start looking at what the individual circumstances are. Yeah, I was just thinking that sometimes there can be pressure on a business, and it might be a busy time. Yes. And, of course, it comes down to the needs of the business, but because sometimes thinking can wrongly go this way, those three didn't need it, why, yeah. why, why do you? And that's not how it should be looked at. No. Um, shall we move on to that, Sorry, well, you know, two, two questions in, I think the underlying theme already there is dialogue, interactive dialogue. Most of these things can actually be resolved by people talking to each other and understanding what it is, the, the, the reasons behind a specific request and what can we do to help you. And only if we can't help you should you really be saying no. Yeah. And it's not just about talking. It's about listening to one another and being reasonable with one another. Because uh, one of the points we try to make clear in the guidance is that, you know, the employer should listen to the employee and try to accommodate their needs. But at the same time, the employee has a responsibility it to the employer, that, very much so that they have a responsibility to their job and to the, uh, the organisation that employs them. So it's about getting that balance right and being respectful of one another. Yeah, and I think again, a lot of employers are used to this already. You know, at Christmas, we know, um, you know, as, as a manager again, I've worked in organisations where, you know, everyone would like time off to spend with their family for Christmas, whether they are religious or not. And a lot of organisations will have a rotor system where, well, you can have this year and then next year you'll be expected to. That's a fairer system. And it's about, you know, just, again, having that conversation and not having someone saying, well, you know, I'm a, a, a strict Roman Catholic, so I must have that time off at Christmas. It's, it's about looking at, well, what's fair and what's reasonable because there are other people who may have times that they want to have that time off because of what their needs, not to do with their religion. And how about, um, obviously, because time off is not always just about festivals or holidays, it must, might be that somebody wants time off to pray yeah. every day. Um, and again, it's is it the same basis that employer and employee need to sort of talk to one another and see what arrangement they could come to that neither harms the business, the employee's role, uh, keeps the employee happy, and the employer's happy too because they've got an em happy employee, you know what? A, a good employer should be letting their employee have time off uh, you know, breaks throughout the day, sorry, you know, so a reasonable amount of breaks. So it's again having that conversation and maybe around timing those breaks around the same time as when that individual needs to pray. Yeah, I think it's about transparency. Yeah. You know? if, if I say, you ask me if you can have time to pray, and I say yes, that shouldn't be a, a closed dialogue between us. I need to be telling Julie as well because otherwise she's like, bloody hell, David is getting time off to do this, you get time off to. Not knowing that you may be coming in an hour earlier in the morning, staying an hour later in the evening, you're not taking snack breaks when she is. You know? yes. So it's telling everybody, so there's transparency and everybody knows how other people are being treated. Because yeah. mm -hmm. employers may or may not know that they do not have to no, give time right. off for no. religious reasons, but obviously uh, it's better that they try to accommodate employees requests um, and another aspect of uh, religion that we're getting uh, interest about is um, somebody saying I'm a religious person uh, can I say what I want about my religion at work or my belief it might be a, a philosophical belief uh, somebody might be a, a, a very uh, ardent green campaigner um, so how, how does that work out in the workplace? Well, I think there are a number of answers to that, or a number of factors to that. I mean, one thing is that um, an ex your 
But you have an absolute, we're getting too technical about this, you have an absolute right to hold your religious belief. But that right doesn't mean that you can go around shouting it to everybody, trying to convert them, telling them how you're right and everybody else is wrong. It's what's called a qualified right under the Human Rights Act and the European Convention on Human Rights. So basically, it means that people realise you have got an absolute right to have whatever belief you want. You don't necessarily have the right to proselytise, try to convince somebody that you're right and everybody else is wrong. So it's again, it's, a, it's about mutual sympathy, mutual empathy, and about how you respect for your work colleagues. So I mean, that's one of the aspects. Of it. And I would say as well, that then can become an issue at work if you overstep that mark, and then you're creating an intimidating and hostile environment yes. for somebody, because your religious beliefs may have a negative impact on an individual, and that could be because they follow a different religion to you, but also it could be because of their, say for example, sexual orientation, they may feel that actually, because you're talking about your religion, and you may be saying things that may be in, in negative connotations towards someone because of their sexual orientation, that you could there be creating an environment that actually could result in harassment in yes. terms of uh, sexual orientation. So, you know, you cannot um, use one protected characteristic over the other, mm -hmm. but it's about making sure that if somebody's creating that hostile environment, you have a duty as an employer to actually sort, you know, rectify the situation. And it might be just about having just a quiet word with that individual. They may not realise that what they're saying is actually causing an offence to another colleague because that individual may not be out in the workplace. So they're, you know, sometimes a lot of this happens, doesn't it, Steve, where one person thinks another thing, they don't have the conversation, that individual thinks they're only saying that because they know I'm gay, yeah. and so they're creating this environment where actually the individual who's got the religious group may not even know, and may be mortified if they know they're having that impact. Mm. So again, having a simple conversation, look, I respect that you have these religious views, but whilst you're at work, can we just focus on yeah. what we need to be doing at work? Because actually, some of your colleagues are getting upset that they feel that you're trying to convert them off. You know, yeah. There's a, there's a time and a place um, for expressing anybody's religious views. And if you know that somebody isn't receptive to them uh, or that they have different views from you, the workplace is neither the time nor the place normally to actually air that discussion. Uh, it's, it's very different having a, a very genuine, concerted belief that you believe in and expressing that when you know other people have contrary views. Perhaps what also needs to be understood is that people might think, um, okay, I happen to be of a certain faith, uh, somebody else is of a different faith, um, I can't really force my views on that person because they're of a different faith. But it can even work within the same faith yeah. that somebody, uh, get two people of the same faith and somebody thinks, uh, you're nowhere near as devout as I am. Uh, you're following the wrong path. I'm going to let you know about it. Um, and even that, if that turned into a hostile atmosphere or environment, for that, that would amount to harassment as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't think that's always that clearly understood. Yeah. And an employer might think, okay, I've had enough of all this. I'm going to ban any talk about religion or belief in the workplace. It causes too much trouble. But then an employer should not do that either. Mm. They can do it to protect the rights of others. Uh, they can do it if it starts to affect the reputation of their business. You know, particularly people go on social media and there's still a connection with the employer and people then think, Oh, these views of this individual could get mistaken as the views of the firm. So there are circumstances where the employer can sort of partially control or well, restrict. I would, say, I would say that the best way uh, an employer could do that is through their equal uh, opportunities policy or their diversity policy or their dignity at work policy, whatever they want to call it which really sets out those guidelines of what behaviour we expect from all of our employees and have a section that covers religion or belief. And again, making it very clear what the boundaries are, whilst you're at work, 
this is how we expect you to behave. And also covering stuff around social media as well, uh, and expecting, setting out those expectations of what behaviour we want from you, and actually what will happen if you do not live up to these values or this expectation that we're setting out. Also, what that policy should have in place is how staff can raise concerns with the organisation. So mm. if they feel that they're being in an environment that's create, you know, hostile or toxic, where do they go to get support? Yes. How do they report concerns? And also that the organisation would take such concerns seriously. Um, people listening uh, and watching this might be interested that ACAS does have a guide on uh, what to do if uh, discrimination happens and the various steps that an employee can take. It's called uh, discrimination. What to do if it's what to do if it happens, and it can be found on the uh, ACAS website. Um, sorry, just before we go on, yes, sorry, I think so. um, an important point there, which we kind of touched upon, is that it's social media. Yeah, everybody yeah. uses it. It's absolutely everywhere today, and I think it's important for employees to realise that simply saying, "But I said it on my own Facebook page. It is my opinion. Surely that can't have anything to do with my work." But it goes back to the point you made earlier, David. If they've got on there, "I work for so and so," and somebody reads it and it's made public as, as a statement, and they read that and they associate that view with the company the person is working for, it could have reputational damage. Mm. So while it seems as if they're actually saying something private solely to fans, if you're not careful, you can be perceived as a uh, talking, making a viewpoint on behalf of your employer, which is when clearly it's not something that either the employee or the employer really want to get into. No, so with social media as well, yeah. there should be a policy and guidelines for staff on what they can and can't do really yeah. or should it's, and shouldn't do. It's essential <coughs> that if you have, like I say, a dignity at work policy or whatever you want to call it, that that really does uh, line with your social media mm -hmm. policy as well. Because that's where, uh, again, as an HR professional, you deal with issues where there's been a debate on Facebook, it's then spilled into the workplace and you're left with having to pick up the pieces. But you're entirely right because you know, it doesn't seem to be how, how many times you say it, but people still have this attitude. Well, I've got my views. Surely I can yeah. express them. Uh, it's it's my profile, my social media, it's my page. Surely I can say what I want, but as you've explained, you can't. Not if it gets linked back to your workplace and things get confused. It's about, I know it's just an odd term, but it's about the proportionality of what you say. If yeah. you're talking to a friend down the pub and you say, this is what I believe, there's a massive difference from saying exactly the same thing on a placard outside a building or a, 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 a church or something mm -hmm. like that. You know, it's about how you say this, who you say this to, and how open it gets to public uh, We've got another question that's um, come in about, um, are there any other uh, sort of major areas um, where, uh, in the workplace where religion or belief discrimination can happen? I'd say right at the beginning of that employment relationship during recruitment, that's actually where discrimination on the grounds of religion and belief can manifest itself really, isn't Not it? Not only that, but it's where you can prevent a lot of the discrimination yes. from happening from being very upfront about what the requirements are with regard to doing the job so that people know exactly what they're letting themselves in for in the first place. Yeah. So a good example of that, and again, we get, you know, employers phoning our helpline saying, you know, I've got this job and I've got a member of staff who's now refusing to do this mm. job because of their religious mm. belief. So for example, it may be working in retail. This person's got to work on the checkout, which means they'll have to handle alcohol yep. and meat and stuff yep. like that. So again, like Steve said, you can actually deal with that right at the beginning when you're interviewing for that job. Um, and that's a particular aspect really of where somebody uh, might apply for a job and then later on they said, well, can I be excused certain duties? Yeah. Um, and as you've already mentioned, it might be alcohol, uh, it might be meat, um, could be contraceptives. Yeah. Um, and this is a particular aspect of it and really what the employer should do as you've said is make it crystal clear what the, the essential duties are, what other duties might be 
and I'll make that clear to the job candidate. And also, if the employer is suitably impressed with that candidate and wants to offer them the job, make sure that those duties are acceptable uh, to the candidate. Because if they come back and say, well, no, the, the, this bit of the job, you know, I, I can't handle me, then it depends um, if they're working in a butcher's shop, well, you know. Yeah, yeah and, and I think it does come down to, first of all, when you advertise that job, listing the tasks that that individual will need to be doing as part of their job. So then an individual can decide whether they want to apply for that job in the first place or not, and then having that conversation during the interview. But I think also it's about looking at workplace adjustments. You know, we tend to think, when we talk about workplace adjustments, we tend to think that's only around disability. But actually, workplace adjustments can be for any reason. And as long as the individual's only unable to do, say, 20% of that work, that should be all right. It's when it's a lot more of the tasks they can't do, then we may have to say, well, actually, this could have an impact on our business and us being able to deliver the product that we need to, to our customers. Yeah, I think, think, you know, the employer... Each employer will have different considerations they need to take into, into account. If you're a big retail supermarket and you have someone who says, I don't really want to handle alcohol, well, there are lots of other shelves that they can be dealing with, there's lots of other yeah. things they can be dealing with. If you're running a very small corner supermarket, two or three staff, the chances are everybody's going to be handling food, meat, and alcohol. So, you know, the, the, the circumstances need to be taken into account. Yeah, I, I, that is absolutely right, because if it means that somebody says, I can't do that part of the job, yeah. but there are other staff who could easily do it without putting extra burdens on yeah. them, then it's, a, it's that word proportionality yeah. again, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Whereas if it means that there's only three people in the team and those two people are going to have to do all this extra work, and it's put them under too much pressure, they can't do their job properly, then yeah. it's not acceptable. And there's been case law out there, hasn't there, Steve, where that has been tested. I think you were saying earlier on, there's quite a well-known case where we had the registrar. Yes, um, Lily Liddell, um, who was a registrar in Islington, and she was undertaking um, civil partnerships at the time, or Islington Borough Council was undertaking uh, uh, same-sex partnerships at the time, and her genuine religious, religious conviction was that she didn't want to. Now, for a while, that was accommodated by um, her fellow registrars who managed to cover for her, but gradually it got to the stage where the burden was too high for the other people, and so therefore Islington required her to actually undertake that, um, that duty, which was made part of her main duties, and when she refused to, that's when they actually got into difficulty regards to enforcing the requirements of her particular job. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that went right to the highest European courts and, and Islington Borough Council, or sorry, sorry, I should say, is the domestic legislation that allowed Islington Borough Council to actually do that was found to be acceptable. You cannot restrict the services that you provide, even if they are restricted for your own genuine and legitimate religious beliefs, they've got to be available to everybody. We'll, we'll leave recruitment for a moment. Uh, we can always come back to it later on because we're getting a few questions coming through. Um, we're, we're getting one about uh, asking if we can talk through uh, opting out of uh, Sunday working requests. But I think we ought to broaden that out because um, a religious day is not always a Sunday. It might be a Saturday. It on might Friday. be a Friday. Yeah, yeah so... Um, Somebody goes for a job. I, th I think it's the same scenario. We, we, we kind of touched on this earlier, yeah. and, and I will give you two kind of two real life uh, domestic cases. One is Sherfi, who was a Muslim security guard who wanted Friday time off for prayers. These are both things I alluded to earlier. He wanted Friday time off to attend prayer meetings, but that was the case where he worked as a security guard patrolling a site and they had to have a minimum number of people on site at that time. And if he had been allowed to go off, then they would have been in breach of contract. The other case was a lady called Celestine and Barr, who was required to work on a rotor on Sundays in a childcare home. And again, allowing her to not work any Sunday placed too much emphasis on other people. So the courts are actually incredibly... Um, 
they come to the same conclusions. Does your employer have a legitimate and genuine reason for saying that you have to be at work at that time? And if it's a legitimate and proportionate reason, then the chances are that they have that they will be allowed to say you can't do that. And of course, there is a difference between somebody saying, "Right, I can't, I've got an interview for you. And I, I really like you, um, and these are the, the jobs that I would like you to do." And you say, "I'm sorry, I can't do Friday midday because of prayers. I need to be home by Sunday on Friday." Or I, I want to have some days off. I mean, for a gun, you know, okay, I can accommodate that. But again, it, that dialogue has got to be up front. Yeah. If the employer says to you, right, Julie, you need to work every Sunday, and you go, yeah, okay, I'm really desperate for this job. And then a month later, you go, actually, I want Sundays off. You know, it, it's clearly not transparent, it's not proportionate. Yeah. And the employer really has every perfectly legitimate chance to say, Look, I'm sorry, you knew the school. But again, you know, the onus is on the employer in the first place to be very upfront with exactly what it is that that employee is being expected to do. I would also say some of it may even go a bit wider when we're looking at rights to request flexible working. Mm. Again, you need to have a genuine business reason why you're saying no to that request. Yeah. And one of those might be, well, actually, I've got too many people who aren't working that day. Yeah. Now, because we've got to think that now, you know, a lot of organisations well, still work seven, seven days, days a week. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it, that could scenario could come up. So, again, it's, it's about using, you know, having that sound business reason for why you're saying no, or when you say yes, why you're being able to say yes. Just um, to kind of touch on that point again, while we've been talking now about actually opting out of, of time off when you're an employee, it's also good practice as an employer to make sure that when you're actually interviewing people, that you have a time and a place that is actually commensurate with you getting the best candidates yeah. that you can yeah. get. If you're actually, large employers may think, okay, we've got an aptitude test to set, we'll, we'll hire a hall in the local local um, conservative club or something like that, and sells alcohol. So that may impact on some people's ability to want to be able to go to that venue. They say, right, we're going to have our, our interviews on a Friday lunchtime. Well, again, you're going to actually possibly exclude yourself from interviewing some really, really good candidates. So doing that little bit of thinking before you even advertise the job means you're going to get the best feel that you can. Afford. And be flexible yeah. where you can and yeah. try to meet requests where you can. Yeah. Again, if you have a good business reason why you can't do it, yeah. then fair enough. Um, we're also getting uh, another question coming through about um, employers who want to use, um, let me just take this in. How would you deal with employer? Right, so I like this is what, do you? Yeah. You can you take it down. Yeah, do, 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 do you want to outline it? What yeah, basically, it I think the question basically just is, if you've got a vacancy and you're wanting to use social media to promote it, say, look, I've got a vacancy, I want these people to come forward, inevitably, the very use of social media means that you have oh, access right. to things that you probably as an employer should or should not have access to. So for instance, you may find out, that, okay, I've used this, this website to promote people, but hey, I'm gonna look at the people that apply to me yeah. from here, and you find out, okay, he's this, she's that, okay, is that the sort of person I want? And therefore that colors your, your thinking yes. before you get there. Now that's an interesting one, and the reason why I like it is because, let's face it, social media is here to stay. It's a very good means of actually hitting a wide target mm. audience. If you only advertise in one place, you're just going to get the same people again and again and again. Yeah. If you advertise in, in, in a magazine or through word of mouth or whatever, and it self perpetuated as, a, as an employer, you want to diversify. You want to have bright young people coming in who are going to be able to diversify, bring different well, bright people of the age. Who would be able to diversify and actually have different views that they can bring to the table. Yeah. Now, social media, great way of getting to the, an awful lot of people, promoting that thing out there. But that comes at a price, doesn't it? Because as they've indicated, are you then going to find out more than you should probably know in advance of the, the interview process? And if and you do, I'm hand over to you as a Well, all, all I'd say, <laughs> just before Julie uh, comes in here, is, is that if you are going to do that, and you do see things that you weren't expecting to see, to try not to take them into consideration because you could misread them. Um, and also, 
using social media has now become uh, more complicated because of the uh, new uh, data protection regulations which have just come in which now means really that reading these regulations what it's is suggesting is that just say you wanted to look at somebody's profile that just because that profile is out there doesn't mean that gives you their permission to look at it so what really employers should do now is say to somebody if they've got a candidate they're interested in oh we'd like to look at your social media profiles where are you because again if they see something they don't like it then colors their decision in a negative way that person finds out about it and say well you didn't have my consent to look at that they're in trouble on that score as well as maybe possibly being accused of discriminating because you saw something about me and you've got entirely the wrong idea. So well, the first answer to that, David, I would say, why would you need to look at someone's social media uh, account? It's common practice yeah, in the recruitment industry, whether we like it or not. Yeah, but my argument as a HR professional is you don't need to look at, at someone's social media account. You know, you're advertising the position, you know, the best way to avoid discrimination is, first of all, having blind recruitment yeah. processes. Yeah. So actually, when you're doing the shortlist, you know nothing about that candidate apart from what they're putting on the application form. And, you know, my question is, is if it's relevant to their job, i.e., if you're employing someone who's going to be heading up your comms and social media, you might want to see how good they are on social media. But apart from that, I can't think of it or working for MI5, you might want to know what they're doing in their private life. But, you know, most organisations, your private life should be your private life within, within reason. reason. Yeah, we, within and, it's part, yeah, and it's part of recruitment. I'm struggling to think of when there would be a reason where actually you legitimately would need to look at someone's social media before you've recruited someone because of... GDPR now, you know, you could find yourself in breach of that because that individual hasn't given you their consent to actually look on their Facebook account, I think for example. The other thing that employers should know, but maybe not all of them do, is that discrimination isn't just as simple as I'm discriminating against you because I don't like you, mm -hmm. or because you're this or because you're that, but there's perception and there's association yeah, as well. Yeah. So looking at somebody's Facebook account and thinking, ah, oh, I don't like that person because they're of this religion or that religion. They may not be, but that's not an excuse. Just because you think they are and you're going to discriminate against yeah. them, it's still illegal to do so. Yeah. And again, association, but which means that I, I treat you differently because you are associated with somebody with a particular protected characteristic. And if I, I'm treating you in a different way because you're associated mm -hmm. with somebody with a particular religion or belief, but again, that would be unlawful. Mm -hmm. Well, again, you might go on and the site and you see a family photo or whatever reason yeah. and notice that their partner might you might think well they belong to a certain religion yeah. or you know they're a, i know we're going off tangent here from religion but they're a particular race yeah. or whatever you know if somebody's got a bias then that could yeah. wrongly uh, colour their decision making. And again, our guidance gives some really good examples of where that could happen during recruitment, uh, where, you know, recruiters would make, you know, we've, I think we've got a really good example where somebody isn't promoted because the manager knows that someone's partner yeah. is a goddess yeah. and thinks, well, actually, we have to go away for work dues and actually she will not fit in with the company yeah. values. So, you know, you need to be very clear if you're refusing someone a job and it's because of religious reasons you probably may be ending up in an employment tribunal yeah um, i think you just the real kind of important word there is because yeah why am i treating you the way i am because and then that's the yeah, answer yeah. it's because of this or it's because of that and that's that's what you really need to take into account um did we want to go back to recruitment at all because um you know whether somebody gets a job in an organization, um, that can still be a problem area if somebody, I'm not going to give you a job in religion uh, in, in my organization because you are, or I think you are, yeah. or your partner is belonging to or that religion, not. or you're not, well, yeah. that's another, uh, 
aspect <laughs> we haven't even touched on. But yes, so I think that can happen um, throughout the entire recruitment yeah. process. From, as you've already said, when you get the job description up, when you advertise it, when you interview, when you then shortlist people, when you offer the job, you know, it might be, oh, well, because you belong to this faith, I'm going to give you less, I'm going to offer you less money yeah. than people on, you know. So I don't know if there's any aspects here we want to sort of I mean, there, draw there, on. There are some times, aren't there, where there'll be a genuine occupational requirement. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and again, our guidance does cover those scenarios. But again, you've got to be very clear as to why it needs to be set out clearly and what part of the quality act you're exempt from and that will be all set out in your job advert but for example if you're looking for a cleaner to work in a church for example actually the cleaner's religious belief shouldn't have anything to do with her ability or his ability to do the job you want someone who is a really good cleaner whatever they believe in has nothing to do with how good they can clean the premises that you're wanting them to clean yeah, I think we should um, make clear that this, what you said there is crystal clear, but the business of uh, occupational requirements, we don't want to get too technical, or there are also other um, exemptions as well in the yeah. Equality Act, where for roles in religion, people can be required to have or not have yeah. certain protected characteristics, but we won't go into that now, I think. But whoever, for, for anybody who's interested, look at the guidance yeah. on the ACAS website yeah. uh, because it does get a, quite a technical area, um, which think, we hopefully we explain quite simply, but I think you're best to look at it there. Yeah, I think the question for anybody who is considering using um, an occupational requirement a protocol would be, why do they need to be of yes. that specific religion? And then that, that gives you the reason you're thinking mm -hmm. and then you need to think and is that a good reason or not yes you know is it really is it a genuine occupational yeah. exactly. requirement yeah. that's why it's called that isn't exactly. it is it a set? there are all kinds of uh, criteria you have to hit mm -hmm. to be able to sort of justify doing this um, but again like i say you know please look at the guidance on the website um we're getting towards the end of the session now um so Perhaps we can sort of help with some next steps for people. Um, what I was going to suggest is that if you're an employee, you've been watching this and listening to it, and you think, oh, I'm an ex employee, I'm experiencing discrimination at work, um, what can I do? What, what should I do? Um, I think what I'd suggest, again, it depends on the circumstances very much, is that if you are in this situation, um, you might the options are you might be able to just go and talk to your manager about it. Um, if that's not an option, because say it's the manager who's discriminating against you, then you might be able to go to your HR department. Again, that's if your employer's got an HR department. Um, or there might be another option where some organizations now have what's called uh, equality champions. Uh, people like Julie, um, who are sort of experts in these areas and you could go to them and their role is to really help sort out problems like this and promote better diversity and a sense of inclusion within organizations um, and if that's not an option then maybe you're a member of a trade union and you can go and see your trade union rep now if you're an employer um, have we each got a sort of a suggestion we would like to sort of make as to what um, we feel. Well, I'd they say the first thing as an employer is have a policy. If you've not got a policy, get a policy in place that again will set out what are your rules, how are you expecting your staff to behave in relation to religion and belief. Uh, and again, our guidance gives you some tips on how to do yeah. that. Yeah. And yeah. um, the other thing I'd say is that the first interaction as an employer you have with an employees when you construct that job either. So think what goes in there because from that everything leads on. You get your applicants, you get through to the, the interview stage and you get the job offer. But making it very clear 
not upfront for the potential employee what it is you're asking them to do is very helpful. But not only that, it helps sharpen your thinking as well. So that if any questions arise in the future, hopefully you've got an answer because you thought it out in from the very get-go. So from Julie, we've got to be make sure you know how you're going to handle requests. Yeah. Uh, from Steve, we've got in terms of your recruitment, uh, make sure that what you do, check what you do, and make sure that there's nothing you do that could potentially lead to you discriminating. It might be completely unintentionally, yeah. but you know that might still happen. And I think what I'd suggest is um, one of the topics we spent quite a lot of time discussing was uh, dress code. Mm -hmm. And again, I think if you've got a dress code or you're thinking of introducing one, then again, please look at the ACAS guidance on all these things. Um, make sure uh, that what you're doing now, go back and check it, review it, and just see, is there anything in there that is going to lead me to discriminating? Am I giving people options uh, to sort of, so they know that if there's a dress code policy, but they think, well, I don't quite fit in here. I don't want to wear, you know, like it might be a lady who wants to be able to cover her legs for religious reasons. Um, so they know that they, what they have to do to approach to the influence, raise it, discuss it, and solve it. Um, and I think really, uh, perhaps we could give people uh, a few links where they can find out more. Um, if you'd like to connect with us on social media, you can do so on Twitter uh, at ACASORGUK. You can also do that on LinkedIn, at LinkedIn uh, at ACASORGUK. Uh, for more re information about religion or belief, uh, you can find our guidance on www.acas.org.uk forward slash religion or belief. And if you would like to know more about dealing with other problems in the workplace, uh, please go to the ACAS website on www.acas.org.uk. For help with discrimination in other areas, such as getting goods and services, um, go to the Equality Advisory and Support Service on www.equalityadvisoryservice.com. Um, I don't know, have we got much time left to, yeah, okay. Do we want to, anything else that we would like to sort of like quickly raise? Um, I, mean, I think we've, we've covered most of the main points there. Mm -hmm. the, the real key is, is interactive dialogue between the employer, the employee, and everybody else as well. There should be no surprises at the end of yeah. the day. You know, if you've got your policies in place, they're legitimate mm -hmm. policies, you should be very happy to tell everybody about them in that you'd be there. I'd agree with that actually Sue, it is about having those upfront conversations and making it clear with everybody what the expectations are and what each party wants. Uh, in, in terms of with a policy, um, it's all very well having one but make sure that the managers understand it, yeah. that they're up to speed with it yeah. because you might have something on a piece of paper or on your website but if nobody knows what it is or understands it, then the policy might as well not be there. So it's important that the manager and the managers who are going to actually look after staff and the staff themselves know what these policies are. So nothing comes as a, as a surprise. The one final thing I'd say is that while we've been talking about religion, don't forget this covers belief as well, and the guidance covers lots of what constitutes a philosophical belief that's equal. Yeah, thank you very much, Steve. Uh, well, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, so it's thank you from Julie, Steve, and myself, and goodbye. Bye. 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 Bye.